Okay, hello, thank you. Um, okay, so yeah, so the talk is from desktop to mobile. And it's gonna be really about the kind of asset pipeline generation we need to take really high level graphics and put them in mobile processors today and to run with everything that comes with mobile AR. So, like I said, my name is Preston Platt. I am the CTO of Rock Paper Reality. A uh, little background into myself. I spent eight years previously as director of AR at ODG. And while there, we did a lot in kind of leading multiple industry use cases, whether it's enterprise or industrial, and how you kind of transition all of that data and all of that, everything that comes with it, into mobile, right? And not only mobile, but headware mobile, where you're seeing you know, stereo see-through and running CV in the background. While there, too, I also did some R&D and worked on some patents in the space, which was a lot of fun. Uh, but now, yeah, currently I am at RPR. And uh, so we're a, a development house focused on integration of technology and content. So let's talk about kind of the overlying problem I see today, um, and that is expectation of AR. So we all probably have seen this in the past, uh, a nice little whale jumping up into the air and into the floor. And so there's some problems with this, right? There's about 100 people watching a continuous experience together. Uh, there's fluid sims running. That whale is probably about 500 million polygons. To do this in a mobile processor would be impossible. And to do this running AR today would be insane. Uh, but that's kind of what we're left with as an expectation. Um, and another expectation, right, is kind of VFX. VFX have been around for a long time. And we've generated many workflows, and actually a lot of these workflows have come from what we've learned in the VFX industry. So right here, you've got dinosaurs that I'm sure took weeks to render. Uh, you've got tracking that is very specific for the environment, and a lot of different things that you can set up to make that happen. So kind of the perspective of render capability, right? We've been taking all of this stuff we love to render, and we've been rendering it for weeks, and then getting this final output that looks incredible. Great. Uh, but now we have to shift all of that and make it run 60 FPS, right? And not only that, it has to be running CV in the background and do a, a lot of uh, different things. So, challenges of AR, right? Complicated and heavy computer vision running in the background. So on your headset, you've got many different cameras, or even on your smartphone, you've got a camera running. It's got to run all that CV in the background and kind of try to optimize that. Um, you're sharing spaces and relocalizing. So, you know, now after I've done that CV, I understand where I am or what's going on in my environment. I not only have that, but then I need to share that information. So, a lot of processing. Uh, another thing to deal with is input devices. We've got phones that have touch. We've got a Magic Leap headset that's got a nice little controller. We've got the HoloLens where we're doing gestures. Um, so, connecting all that together can be a bit of a mess. Uh, but at the end of the day, has to be in a small compact device that sits on your head and we have very strict uh, ideas of what that should look like. And not only that, it, the battery life has to last more than 30 minutes and you can't overheat the thing on your forehead so it freaks you out. So there's a lot of challenges that come with this, right? Um, but so what I kind of want to show is a demo that I did, my most recent demo, where I kind of took this and I, I generated a lot of different workflows and a lot of different pipeline ideas on how to make it run efficiently. So this is a multiplayer game uh, running basically off the idea of a game called Horse. I don't know if you guys know of this game called Horse. And you're throwing a basketball and you have to shoot from where you're shooting. So let's play that a little bit here. And so by using four different pairs of glasses, there we use the ODG headsets, um, you know, it localizes where you are, puts your player number over your head, you're able to shoot, it gives you all the data that that's happening, running in AR together. Um, you know, as he's shooting, he's able to kind of get some physics. You'll see some net physics that are running, a lot of rigid body sims. See, he, he made the shot, so it's going to draw a circle around the floor. you got to go shoot from there. You brick it, right? Do a little fun Easter eggs here and there, and then run some particle sims to say, hey, you've got your winner. Um, so that was a process to get to that level, right? And so, you know, you start with the art phase, and you start with kind of just understanding, okay, we, I've, I know what I want. I know what I want it to look like. And so I've got these different, you know, art pieces I'd put together for the overall look and aesthetic. You know, the basketball hoop in the bottom is probably a 500,000 polygon model that's running there. You got the basketball that I did photogrammetry on that came out to like 2 million polygons. Uh, you know, everything here, y the real takeaway is that this all took days to render out, right, as far as the look development is concerned. So let's talk about the development practices. So these are kind of the things that I generated over the last eight years on how to kind of take these, these ideas that we have and kind of 
build them into these lower level mobile devices. So you have lighting and rendering pipeline, polygon count optimization, photogrammetry when it's applicable, um, subsurface scatter global illumination, that's kind of the understanding of light. Uh, and then utilizing the environment for reflection and shadows on a headset, we don't have them, but you know, on smartphones we still do. And then maybe how you use light in the absence of not having those shadows. So the first one, lighting and rendering pipeline. So what you're seeing here on the left is uh, kind of a use case demo I put together that's kind of an R&D use case. And so what's happening here is this tree is breaking through the floor, right? Great. So what, what's really nice, though, is that it has a very good understanding of the environment around it. It's getting that photorealistic look running at 60 FPS. So it understands the light source is coming from the main window, which as you turn to the left here, you'll kind of see the light source is coming from that direction. But it also is able to take the floor and sample the floor that it's on. So I'm able to say, I have a relevance to this floor, and I'm going to project that on top of it. So that's really cool in the way that it grounds everything to the environment. So that was uh, kind of a challenge. I think the biggest thing I took away from this is the optimizing of UVs. And if you guys aren't familiar with the 3D space, UVs are kind of a way to lay out your 3D model so that you can actually texture it. But within texturing it, you can also do a lot of really cool baking strategies so that you can actually make things look photorealistic. Photorealistic. Um, another great thing to note here is that this is running on AirKit, but it works super efficiently in a headset like a HoloLens and a Magic Leap headset. So it kind of covers all the bases. And you'll see I don't do any strong shadows kind of for that reason. Diffuse shadowing works. Hard floor shattering, not really. So let's talk about poly count optimization. So this is a production level asset, right? This is something you might get if you're working on a movie or anything like that. It's about 700,000 polygons. Um, what you're seeing at the bottom left underneath the 700,000 po polygons is the rendered output of look running. Um, you know, you can imagine 700,000 polygons. I was getting about 12 frames per second on a head-worn device. Um, but with a strategy I kind of implemented, I was able to get this down to about 200 polygons. And what I think is really key to look at, if you can look closely, is that you probably don't see any difference in the look and feel of that 200 polygon asset, right? And this thing runs 60 plus on mobile. It will be the most efficient thing you've seen. And, you know, as a visual representation above, what I tried to do is give you a little vibe for the wireframe. Wireframe being kind of edges, edges that connect, create a polygon. That's where you get 700,000 polygons. And this one, as you can see, you're seeing very minimal lines that just kind of outline just the basic detail. But because of that whole baking strategy, you're not seeing any difference in the quality. And that's key. So as an overview, or just kind of an oversight as to the you know, using headboard devices, I try not to exceed 40,000 polygons in my scene, which is really low in comparison to what I've seen a lot of people try. And um, I, I also think it's, you know, details can be baked in. If you're worried about anything you're doing in the content space or anything, just think, okay, there's probably a creative way to bake all this down into something that's efficient. And then LODs, which stands for level of detail, those are a great system for distance. So if I'm, you know, all the way back where you guys are back there, I probably can render that chair at a much smaller rate processing-wise than maybe this chair that I can see really closely. OK, so then we get into photogrammetry. I think a really photogrammetry is one of the greatest things ever, but can also be kind of a hindrance. So for that basketball game specifically, I created this basketball that's down here at the bottom. And it, it was great. It's a great asset. It was really efficient. But then I put it in the headset, and I let it bounce around the floor. And I was like, wow, that really doesn't look good. It really doesn't fit in the environment whatsoever. And it was kind of because I realized, you know, that's a rendered 3D object that, I, that has no real feeling of, of grime or that it's been used in this world. So I said, OK, I'm going to take a basketball. I'm going to take 750 photos of it, compile it together using photogrammetry software. And y you know, the output is this 200 million polygon asset. But great, revert back to my last slide on polygon optimization. You can totally optimize it. So after that, got this great photogrammetry looking basketball that when it was put in the real world felt like you could touch it essentially because of the lighting, the texturing, everything looks so grounded in realism. So not used for everything, but still very useful. Hand modeling can still be the best approach sometimes. Um, and a great thing, an another great thing about photogrammetry, it doesn't apply to this ball so much, but let's say you've got this chair here. If you run photogrammetry on the chair, you can actually have a way better understanding of the relative size of it because in photogrammetry, you're actually getting relatively 
the perfect exact correlation to all the dimensions. So can be useful for that reason. A lot of people kind of veer away from it because if you can see on the basketball, there's dark portions to it and there's also light portions to it. So that means that it's got this baked in lighting that maybe doesn't fit what I want it to fit in. But there's great de-lighting tools that exist that basically strip all that lighting out and give you that raw texture and raw model. So can be useful. I would suggest it in certain situations. So subscatter subsurface scattering and global illumination. Um, this is a really important topic. So it, in day to day, light is constantly absorbing through different materials. Our skin is a very good representation of that. But also like this, this digestive body is a great representation. If I had lungs sitting out in the world and I had a light source on it, you're gonna see that light scatter through the object and kind of illuminate it in very different ways. This is really, really important. If you, I don't know, who probably people have seen augmented reality content or game content that just looks flat and like plastic and it's got this weird shine to it and maybe it doesn't look you know, fully correct. If you can bake in things like that, where you get the light bounce and you get all these different things, it feels like a much more physical object. And I think another key thing to remember here, this is running 60 FPS on probably one of the world's smallest headset devices. There's, there's not a lot of compute that's up there, right? So that's that baking strategy. And while it's great to see it on a medical model like this, the I put the number four down here in relevance to the basketball game because I wanted a very cool stylistic look to the way that that number would sit over their head, right? And so what's actually happening is these light sources are really illuminating and kind of building that nice tangible looking um, object. But yeah, it will help with the plastic look, that's for sure. Um, okay, and then so reflections, it, it this is one of the best things for head-worn devices but also great for mobile that helps you ground anything you're doing, content, uh, anything, in the environment, right? So if you've got a, s so up on the top, the top little graphic there, that's kind of a representation of what you would have out of a great um, scan or a great slam map or something. So you've got color data that's already there. When you place the object in the scene, it can reflect that environment. And lighting is a big part of grounding something in the environment, but the reflections that that actually has can also ground it heavily in the space. And so one of, uh, I, I'm kind of attached to this because I have a patent on it, but this uh, video at the bottom, w I was able to set up a 360 camera and actually use a Wi-Fi 360 camera and pipe that out into Unity and run. So this, this object right here is actually a fully 3D object that's actually mimicking the entire world. And what you're gonna see right now is that disappears, there's the camera, right? That's actually a 3D object. And as you see me come in, you can see me come in and out and in. And so it's actually perfectly mimicking me in the real world which is really cool. It actually it, it really helps sell realism. Um, but yeah, so scan data, using that to help ground things really makes a difference. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, hey, if you can set up a 360 camera and get that going, it's really fun. And so the last thing is shadows and light. Uh, this is a video from Magic Leap's Drive demo, and I really love what they did here, right? They've got these, these um, spotlights running on the front of the car that really accentuate the environment that they have built. Right, and so why they don't have shadows because they're an additive display. What they did was they decided to put these, these, these um, spotlights that can give off a shadow, so that you feel like the car is really on that wall. Convergence in AR headsets helps that, but this is a really great way to sell it. And so if you can do shadows, if you're running on a smartphone, great, do them. But if you're not, tricks like this can really make all the difference. And so. I think my main takeaway from this is, yes, the expectations are out there. They're, they're really hard to meet. But if we're creative, we can totally get there and, and kind of at least get closer to what that goal is and what people expect to see in AR. Um, but yeah, so thank you. Uh, that's my contact. If you guys would like to contact me, me um, and talk about this at all. And then I'd also love to open it up for questions. Preston, thank you. Awesome. Very impressive what you can do by tweaking the content, reducing the polygons, and really, yes. yeah, awesome. So, any any questions from you? Yeah, please. Uh, uh, head over because otherwise, uh, I need my fitness goal today. Uh, thanks for the talk; it was really good. Thank um, you. One thing that might have been outside the scope, but something that we've dealt with a lot in optimizing is optimizing shaders and mm -hmm. kind of in moving from desktop to mobile, dealing with like alpha testing and things that are just 
more intense for things like effects and you were talking about subsurface scattering and things like yes. that. So do you guys um, kind of like, what's your approach to writing shaders and uh, utilizing shaders? Absolutely. So I, I think it's a very important process. And I'd say that we love to use our own custom shaders when it comes to smartphones, right? Where when you're using camera pass through for a phone, if you're dealing with latency, yeah, you don't really see it, right? Which is great. Um, but when it comes to head-worn, I really like to be creative in the ways in which I bake things, right? So that subsurface scattering was running, you know, it's rendering dual on uh, a very lightweight headset, right? And, and you wouldn't get that look if I wrote a custom shader that maybe bogged down the system too much. I might get down to 12 FPS, right? And so there are certain situations where it's totally viable, and I, and I could not back it more. But I'm more of an advocate for if you can get creative in the ways in which you optimize that and keep and keep it running. It's all about the use case, though, as I'm sure you could imagine. But thank you. Yeah, great question. Any other questions? So you can actually sample a section, right? If you understand the environment, you can actually sample a section of that environment if you use a camera, right? So you can actually sample and get a runtime version of that floor that you can then projection map if you've got your UV set correctly on top of it. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Any other questions? I made my. Uh, I love the opening what you did with Magic Leap on the Blue Whale. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's a <laughs> we've we've got expectations that are set pretty high right now. Exactly, you know, and, th and that's the question. Videos. So do you think that uh, the expectation of the customers or the industry is the root cause that we just set the expectation different at the beginning? I mean, it's not only Magic Leap. It's really all the customers we're talking, yeah, but it must be possible. I saw it on YouTube. Yes, of course. I mean, this is something I've dealt with a lot, obviously being at a company where we make headward, uh, at headsets for eight years. It's how do we, you know, somebody releases a video that uh, is a concept video that they maybe don't explain that it's too much of a concept. And, you know, that's the expectation at that point. So what's your experience? How can you really level then the expectation down? Or is it more a rational thing? Or do you really, I'm sure this is the technology what is capable right now. This is the performance requirement, or let's say the hardware requirements. Yeah. And the hardware setup, so we can't get out any more. Yeah. Yes. So my suggestion would be to not put out vaporware. Put out put out videos of things that you have running and only pitch that. Um, I think that would be my main takeaway. Uh, and that usually helps us sell projects very well as well. Totally agree. Yes. Preston, Thank awesome. you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you.